The landscape of PlayStation 2 emulation has improved quite a bit in the past year for the Mac, so this video is an in-depth tutorial on Mac PlayStation 2 emulation for 2025, and hopefully for this time for years to come. It'll cover everything from setting up controllers to even graphics fidelity updates like adding in texture packs to improve visual fidelity in PlayStation 2 games. This is a fast-paced tutorial, and I intend for you to skip around and watch the parts again. Use the chapters. Here we are at the PCSX homepage. We have the latest stable release and the latest nightly releases where we can download the emulator. In this video, I'm going to use the latest nightly release as this is the latest and greatest and most cutting edge version of the emulator. However, if you have problems, you can always get previous versions of the nightly releases where you might have to toggle on and off the show previous versions. Just be aware this website may have changed by the time you watch this video. Or if we go back to the homepage, you can also download the stable version. This is going to be a older version of the emulator that is more stable all around, but may not have as extensive compatibility and the latest and greatest features. So let's download the latest nightly release. Just click here and then click download for Mac OS. Take just a second and it's about 20 some megabytes. If we double click it to decompress it, we can then drag it into our applications folder. The first run is going to be a little weird because if you double click this, you're going to see this error that says cannot be open because the developer cannot be verified. This messaging can change between the various versions of Mac OS. For Mac OS 14 and below, what we can do is just hit cancel and then we hit right click and then we can hit open. And then from here, we click open to whitelist that application. However, if you're on Mac OS 15, if you double click or right click an application that is not signed code, you'll see the following message in Mac OS 15. Apple's made this much more annoying to deal with. In your preferences, go to privacy and security. Scroll down to security and you'll see that the application was blocked. Click open anyway. Apple will throw one more scare tactic pop up in front of you. Click open anyway to whitelist the application. In future versions of macOS, this may have changed, so you may have to follow a different process. Now it's time to walk through the setup wizard. The first screen can be largely ignored unless you need to change the language or you want to experiment with some of the very ugly themes. I am going to stick with native. Click next. PCSX2 in order to run requires a copy of the Sony PlayStation 2 BIOS. The BIOS on the PlayStation 2 is the firmware in the console that initializes the hardware, manages the boot up processes, and provides an interface for loading games or accessing the system settings. These are copyrighted, so downloading them isn't necessarily legal. Due to the legality, I am not going to link these directly, so please don't ask. But if you're clever in a search engine, you can probably find these on sites like archive.org. The default BIOS directory is your username, library, application support, PCSX2, BIOS. If you would like to store these somewhere else, you can locate the folder using the browse feature. Personally, I'm okay with the default location, so I'm going to click the open BIOS folder. Then from here, I'm going to drag in my 100% legally obtained BIOS into the BIOS folder. Back in the emulator, I'm going to click refresh list. Since I'm located in North America, I'm going to click on the USA BIOS to make it my default pick and then click next. The next screen is game directories, and this is where you have all your PlayStation 2 games stored on your computer. PCSX2 supports a wide variety of formats, all listed on this screen. It is very easy to rip your own games on a Mac or PC using an optical drive. I will not be covering how to make your own ISOs in this video, however I will be making a follow up video. Look for it as a pinned comment on this video. Please don't ask me where you can download the games because they are copyrighted. I have a directory of games, so I'm going to click Add. I've located where my games are and I'm clicking Open. You should see a message that pops up asking if you would like to scan recursively. This will allow the emulator to search through any of the folders inside the folder you selected. So click Yes. Now it's time to set up the controller. By default, macOS supports Xbox and PlayStation controllers. Apple support documentation has a list of which controllers are supported, and I'll have this document linked in the description. People will inevitably ask if you can use a mouse and keyboard, and yes you can, but it is absolute pain, so I do not recommend it. In this video, I'm not going to cover the pairing process, so I'm just going to use my PlayStation 4 controller in wired mode by plugging in into my Mac. We do not need to change the controller type, so we're going to click Automatic Mapping. Then I'm going to select the controller that I've plugged in. In my case, this is the PS4 controller. This will automatically configure your controller. I only have this one controller, so I'm not going to configure controller port 2. 
We can click next and now click finish. At this point you can start playing games. All it takes is double clicking one of your titles. Here I am playing SSX3 at the default resolution. But one of the best things about PlayStation 2 emulation is you can really improve the graphics fidelity. Under the PCSX2 menu, we're going to go to Preferences. Then we're going to click Graphics. The first thing we'll want to change is the renderer. Metal is Apple's default graphics API and it'll give us the best performance, so select that. In the Preferences, if you hover over Settings, you'll notice it gives you a description. On the off chance that bilinear filtering is off, you'll want to enable it. The next step is we're going to click Rendering. Please keep in mind if you up your graphics fidelity, it will incur a performance hit. Older computers with less powerful GPUs and CPUs will not be able to bump as high in resolution or graphics fidelity. Because I'm on a beefy Mac Pro 2019 with a decent GPU, I can bump up the resolution to 4K without any real problems. The next thing I'll want to change is anisotropic filtering. This really helps with rendering textures at extreme angles. Again, I have a decent computer, so I'm going to bump this up to 16x. Now if I go back to SSX3, it'll look a lot sharper. Let's do a quick comparison. Here's the game running at standard definition, and now it's running at 4K. Even at low quality in YouTube, you probably can see some of the difference, but there's still more we can do with the graphics. If I go back to the preferences and then to the graphics setting and under display, we can force this to be widescreen. Go to aspect ratio and select widescreen. Now when we go back to the game, we can see that it is indeed widescreen. However, it's only stretching the image, so everything looks a little distorted. While working on this video, I made one minor mistake, and that is I didn't enable V-Sync while capturing the footage, so sorry if you see any tearing. But let's go into how you fix that. Go to Settings, go to Emulation, and make sure that Vertical Sync or V-Sync is enabled. Just check that. That's it. V-Sync is a display setting that synchronizes a game's frame rate with the refresh rate of the monitor to prevent tearing, which multiple parts of a frame are visible on screen simultaneously. Also on this screen, you can adjust the emulation speed if you would like to play a game at faster or slower speeds. If we go back to Preferences and then Graphics and Post Processing, we have a few more options. Sharpening makes the image a little crisper. This is entirely a personal preference thing, so I'm not going to really play with it for this video, but you can mess with it here. Lastly, we have TV shaders that are emulating CRT TVs. These strike me as fairly gimmicky, but if you like it, then use it. Here's one in action, and you can see that it just basically applies an overlay. Now it's time to talk memory cards. One of the great things about emulation is you can have virtually unlimited memory cards. Go to Preferences and click Memory Cards. We can manage our memory cards through this interface. We can create our own memory cards using the Create button. We can see a bunch of different size options. While the 8MB card is the most compatible, the emulation authors actually recommend using a folder. So we're going to create a folder. I'm going to give it a name of PS2 Game Saves. Then I'm going to click OK. A folder literally saves the game saves inside a folder rather than a virtual memory card. To start using it, I'm going to eject the memory card in slot 1, then I'm going to drag the ps 2 gamesavesps 2 into the slot 1 area. You can download virtual memory cards and game saves off the internet from various websites. Virtual memory cards are straightforward as you just load those directly into a slot. Individual game saves can be loaded into a folder. You would do this by clicking the open button, then going into the .ps2 folder, and then dragging the files into this. It's time to switch gears again back to graphics. This time, texture replacements. This is a feature that I touched on on my previous version of this tutorial. Now that it's more mature, it's seriously cool. Dedicated fans will hand touch up or upscale the textures used in PlayStation games. The result is much more detailed graphics. The only downside is you have to seek out these texture packs. I found one for SSX3, so I'm going to use that for this demonstration, and the link for this one will be in the video. I already have my texture pack downloaded and decompressed. Under the preferences in the graphics setting under the texture replacement tab, we will want to check load textures. Then under the search directory, I'm going to click the open button. Then it's just a matter of dragging the textures into this folder. The SSX3 textures came in the SSX3 folder. This is not the folder we want. We want the one inside it that looks like machine code. Let's go back to the emulator. We can close the preferences now. Now when I load SSX3, it'll use the higher resolution textures. These texture packs can vary quite a bit in quality depending on the artists who are involved in the project. 
This SSX3 texture replacement patch is just alright by my opinion, but it is a mild improvement and mostly looks like an AI upscaling. I imagine at some point in the future, AI upscaling will be a automatic feature within emulators. Notably, because these are higher resolution textures, it will have an impact on performance. The next feature I want to touch on is save states. First off, you can pause the game at any point by just hitting your spacebar. Doing this pauses the emulator instead of hitting the start button. Save states in video game emulation are snapshots of an entire game's state at a specific moment, allowing players to save and reload progress instantly regardless of the in-game save features. In order to use save states, you do not need to pause the game, but it makes it easier. Clicking system, I can go to save state, and now I'm going to save this to slot 1. I'll hit spacebar and unpause the game. Just give me one second and I'll take a really bad shot. Let's say that was the game winning shot. I'll click the system menu and then go to load state and load my most recent game save. Now I can retake that shot. And guess what? I made it this time. Obviously this is a very powerful feature, but guess what? It even gets better. Save states allow you to skip even booting a game. Check this out. I'll close the emulator and you'll see this dialog box. Are you sure you want to shut down the virtual machine? Take notice of the checkbox below that says save state for resume. Let's check this and then close the emulator. I've relaunched the emulator and now watch what happens when I double click NBA Street Volume 2, the game I was playing. A resume state was found for this game. Do you want to load this save or start from a fresh boot? If I click load state, watch what happens. The game doesn't even need to boot, it loads exactly to where I triggered the save state. This has been a feature of emulators for quite some time, but it's still an amazing feature. For our next trick, we can spiffy up the way games are presented in our emulator. Let's switch from list view to the grid view. Well, this view is not that interesting because it doesn't have the game art. But we can fix that, it's really easy. Under tools, go to cover downloader. In order to make this work, we need a cover art library, and that's just a URL. There is a GitHub project just for the PS2 covers, and it's very easy. Of course, the link is in the description. From the GitHub project, we're just going to grab this URL and copy it. Then take it back to the download covers window and paste it in there. Click start, and it'll start downloading the images. After a few seconds, my cover art has completely downloaded. We can still do a bit more on this screen. Click view and then click toolbar. This is completely optional, but now you can access common features without having to go to the menus. Another thing we can do is launch the PlayStation 2 BIOS, and this is useful for memory card management. We can find the start BIOS under system, but we can also click start BIOS right here. I'm not sure why this loaded in, I think this is German, but it did. And I can access my memory card from here. If you want to delete or copy things off a memory card, this is how you would do it. My memory card is blank, so there's not much to show here. Now let's look at the controller setting more in depth. Go to settings and controllers. If for some reason you were having controller problems, we'd go here. First, let's click on controller port 1. And we can redo the automatic mapping if for some reason we're switching controllers or it's not detecting properly by clicking the automatic mapping menu. Again, we can see my PS4 controller. Right now we're viewing the bindings, aka what button does what. If you have a controller that does not support automatic mapping or you want to change the button layout, you can do it here. I'm going to click clear mapping to show off how you would do this. It'll give me a warning, but I can always remap this controller by using automatic mapping too. If I go to automatic mapping, I can just remap the controller, but we're going to clear the mapping yet again. Okay, now let's get started. Setting each button is a bit tedious. First click the setting you'd like to set. I'm going to click up on the D-pad. Now I'm going to click up on my controller. Then you need to do this for every single button. Also, the emulator supports actual PlayStation USB accessories. If we click on one of the USB ports, we can then select what kind of device we would like to connect. Let's add a webcam, aka the iToy. I don't believe this works with the Mac yet, but by the time you watch this, maybe it does. Or perhaps it's my setup or you actually need an iToy camera. I wouldn't be surprised at some point in the future if you can just use your webcam on your computer. You would select it from the video device, then you would select your audio device. Now for one of the most underutilized features. Just right click any game from your games list and go to check wiki page. This will launch the official PCSX2 wiki page for that title. The wiki contains a lot of useful information around compatibility and performance and even potential workarounds. The only thing I didn't touch on is the network and HDD emulation. For most users in games, this is not a feature that you need to touch. 
But if you're interested in online play, check out ps2online.com. In my limited experience, this feature is still a bit rough. Mostly, I just want to point out that it exists for the people that are interested going down this rabbit hole. Before we go, there's one last thing to cover, and that's achievements. If you'd like to use achievement tracking, you can go to retroachievements.org and create an account. Then go back to the emulator, under account, log in, and then you will want to, of course, enable achievements. PlayStation 2 emulation is very much evolving over time. PCSX2 can play a very limited amount of PlayStation 1 games. Here is Crash Bandicoot running within PCSX2. This is not the way to experience PlayStation 1 games, as there's much better emulators out there. I have a tutorial on how to use DuckStation on your Mac to play PlayStation 1 games. I also have a very popular tutorial for using RPCS3 to emulate PlayStation 3 games on your Mac. Hopefully this version of this tutorial stays relevant longer, because my last one referenced AetherSX2, which is a ARM native version of PCSX2, thus it performed better on Apple Silicon Macs. But PCSX2 runs great on even Apple Silicon Macs, including the M1. I think even the M1 can do 4K. So thanks for watching this. I hope this was informative, and thanks to my Patreons. Peace.